Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, May 6th, Senate Judiciary. Um, we're in extra innings. Um, we officially closed the committee last week, but we have permission from the pro tem to do a couple of meetings this week and a couple of meetings <laughs> next. Um, this morning, we're going to be looking at House amendments to S3, possible House changes. And we've got Eric Fitzpatrick to walk us through that. Morning, Eric. Do you Morning, Senator Brew. Do you want to share your screen? Yeah, absolutely. If, uh, if uh, the committee is OK with that, I think that would be the most efficient way to see what the, the language differences are between the, the bill that passed the Senate and the bill that, that the House is, well, actually, it hasn't passed yet, that, but the House is working on. <laughs> what does their timing look like? I heard, again, these things always are moving moving targets this time of year, but I heard that uh, they thought it might be on the floor tomorrow. Okay. Um, but, you know, that could always change. Yeah. Um, so shall I yeah, share the wanna, screen now? Does that make sense? Go ahead. Are you a co-host? I think so. Yep. Okay. And um, Senator Sears will be with us. He's monitoring right now. He's taking care of a few things and he'll be with us momentarily. Does everybody see this document that uh, highlighted at the top says uh, house changes to sections one to five? Yep. Yes. Okie doke. Uh, so, uh, for the record, it's Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to walk the committee through the uh, uh, proposed change that the House uh, is making to S3, which is an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. I'm sure the committee recalls, having spent a lot of time on this, that this uh, bill has uh, many different provisions related to the, to the statutory procedures that are mandated uh, when a criminal defendant um, is uh, either raising the issue of competency to stand trial or insanity as a defense or uh, has been found incompetent to stand trial or insane at the time of the offense and the, the procedures that follow that finding. So there's a lot of different um, uh, provisions within the bill that are related to those procedures. So I think as I walk through them, I'll kind of take a moment and remind the committee of what's being talked about in each section. So uh, I'll, I'll jump right in. Uh, section one has to do with the uh, examination of a criminal defendant's uh, competency or sanity at the time of defense that, that the court orders whenever the issue is raised, whether it's raised by the defendant in the context of raising an insanity defense or by the court or one of the parties with respect to competency. But when, when the issue is raised, uh, then the court orders an independent evaluation um, of the person uh, to, to get an independent psychiatric evaluation of the person's mental health status. So uh, what you recall had been happening in section one here as it passed the Senate was that, uh, and, and this sort of turns on the issue of, you may recall uh, the point that competency to stand trial and sanity at the time of the offense are two different things, two different evaluations, two different moments in time uh, that are being evaluated. And uh, so what section one did was it made sure that uh, because the language, the statute on the books was seemed to suggest that the evaluation always had to evaluate both competency and sanity, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't comport with what actually happens or, or the reality since competency and sanity are two different things and sometimes one is raised, but not the other. So the language is clarified as the Senate passed it to make sure that, uh, that the evaluation can evaluate competency or sanity or both. And that's lines one through 15 there. Uh, but in it sort of related to that is the fact that, and this is something that um, was added by the House, is that uh, as it happens, when a person's uh, sanity or competency uh, is the result of a mental illness, then that person, 
that person's evaluation is conducted by a psychiatrist. However, there are, it's also provided for in the statute that a person's competency or sanity can be the result of something other than a mental illness. It could be a developmental disability, for example, uh, or a traumatic brain injury. Um, when the person, when that's the case, uh, we'll see later on, a couple of different things flow from that. And one is, the one that you're looking at right now, is that when a person's uh, competency or sanity is the re uh, uh, may be the result of a developmental disability, then there's a statute, a specific statute a pre that already exists that says that this evaluation uh, also has to be done by uh, a psychologist with expertise in developmental disabilities. So in other words, although if it, it's, uh, uh, the existing provision is correct that it's only a psychiatrist when it's a person uh, whose condition is the result of a mental illness, there a couple of changes were made here to make clear that, well, that's true, but additionally, there has to be a psychologist with expertise in developmental disabilities uh, participating in the evaluation if, uh, if it's a developmental disability that's being raised. So that's what you'll see this repeated several times right here, this language you see on lines 20 and 21 about the evaluation. It's, a, it's conducted by the examining psych psychiatrist and here's the highlighted language uh, uh, if applicable, so it's going to be either a psychiatrist, that's line 20 existing, um, uh, and if, if applicable under section 4816B, and that's the statute that I just referenced that says specifically, if it's a developmental disability, it also has to be a psychologist. Um, so this is just roping that in. If section 4816B applies, then it's the psychiatrist and the psychologist. Eric? Um, yes. Just, um, the word or is struck there? Yeah, I'm wondering the same thing. It it shouldn't be struck, am I correct? I believe that's correct. Well, I think it should be, yes. I mean, uh, it's, it's funny because uh, there was a, a, a lengthy debate about um, whether it should be or or and in the house. <laughs> but yes, yeah. I, think, I think you're right. It, or is what it should be, thank you. Okay. Let's keep going. Yep. Uh, let's see. So the uh, you may also recall. So the report that is generated after <clears throat> this evaluation, uh, you may recall that one of the provisions that was added in the Senate bill was because there is an existing list. I'm on page two now, lines two through seven of who gets a copy of the report, and the Senate had added line five, the commissioner of mental health, which makes sense, right? Because the, the department is very much involved in these proceedings and, the, and if the defendant, uh, the defendant may be committed to the department's custody, so it makes sense that they would get a copy of the report. And that's what the Senate added. Um, two more parties were added by the house to get a copy of the report. Line four is the respondent, that's the defendant. So the defendant, uh, him or herself would also get a copy. And then line six or seven of the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. Now this is connected to the point I just made about developmental disabilities. That's because the other consequence that could flow is it if, if the person's uh, <clears throat> lack of competency or sanity is the result of a developmental disability, um, then the person would not be committed uh, to the Department of Mental Health if they're found dangerous. Rather they are under, by statute, they are committed to the custody of Dale. So uh, it would make sense that, as you see the way it's written, and if applicable, then Dale gets a copy of the report. So in other words, I think, as everyone understands, that means if it's a developmental disability that's involved, um, then since Dale would be the person who would potentially get in custody of the person, then they would also uh, get a copy of the report in that instance. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the uh, the um, next provision involves, remember, the, the issue, and the committee had discussed this as well, that uh, what happens when, uh, as we're talking about, uh, the fact that competency and sanity are two different things, and 
as we looked at in the previous section, the evaluation does not have to uh, does not have to evaluate both of those uh, both of those uh, issues, but it could. And so this provision, remember, de dealt with exactly that instance. Well, what if the court does order? What if the psychiatrist or or psychologist has been asked to provide opinions as to both of those things, both competency and uh, sanity at the time of the offense. Well, the Senate passed language, and this is lines eight through 15, provided that if that's the case, then the report has to address both of those issues separately, and, and they have to be presented in separate reports, which again, makes sense because as we're talking about, they're two different things. And uh, it went on to say, this is lines uh, sort of, yeah, ele end of 11, 12 to 15, that um, the examination of the person's sanity would only happen, uh, would only take place if uh, the psychiatrist or, again, this is that language I mentioned earlier, a psychiatrist or line 13, if applicable, the psychiatrist and the psychologist, uh, if they're able to form the opinion that the person is competent to stand trial again. And that the idea of that is that, you know, sanity is a defense that the defendant would not be raising would if, uh, they're not in the found competent to stand trial in the first place because uh, in order for the proceeding to go forward, uh, there has to be uh, a finding of competence. So if that never happens, if the defendant is never found competent, then the sanity issue would never come into play. The defense would never be raised. So uh, it makes sense both in terms of logistically and efficiency of resources <clears throat> that you, know, you wouldn't do the sanity evaluation if it's never going to be needed. So that's why that language was in there as it, as it passed the Senate to make clear that the sanity evaluation doesn't happen until competency is established. So what the House added to that uh, is you see highlighted in lines 15 to 21. And the first piece is, you see that's sort of a clause, lines 15 and 16, adding on to that point that I just made about the timing of the evaluation. It says, yes, okay, the, the, the it provides the defendant with the opportunity to request that they occur concurrently. So yes, generally speaking, as, as you provided in your language, sanity evaluation doesn't happen uh, until after competency is established. Line 15 highlighted though, unless defendant requests that they occur concurrently. So it provides the defendant with the, the option essentially. And that's based on uh, the actual, actually the ABA, the American Bar Association has some model, mm -hmm. model language on this uh, that's very similar to what, what you passed in the Senate but it does add that provision. It recommends that the defendant have the option um, to, to request that they occur concurrently, and that's what, what that is based on. The second, the last second sentence uh, provides, <coughs> to, addresses the point that if you think about uh, the situation in which the sanity evaluation is delayed. So let's say, you know, it doesn't happen uh, at the time of the competency evaluation, as we've just provided for here, you know, you've said, look, the two things are separate and sanity evaluation doesn't happen until competency is established. So in that instance, if you, if you think about it, it could be quite a long time before, you know, the person could be going through years of treatment before, if, uh, to establish competency, uh, and it might take quite some time. And if the, if the sanity evaluation doesn't happen until competency is established, that could be years, years after the offense or quite some time, whatever it may be, after the offense was actually committed. And so uh, I think the concern discussed uh, in House Judiciary was, well, might there be uh, you know, loss of evidence during that time? Might their people's memories not be as, as good? People tend to you know, forget things over time. It's natural. So they provided for uh, uh, the language here that would require the psychiatrist or psychologist, whoever's making that evaluation, that it, if, there, if that happens, if you see in line 16, if the evaluation of the defendant's sanity uh, doesn't occur until the defendant is deemed competent, if that's the case, uh, then go to skip down to line 19, psychiatrists and psychologists shall make a reasonable effort to collect and preserve any evidence <laughs> necessary to form an opinion as to sanity if the person regains competence. So the idea is at the time of that competency evaluation, even though they're not doing the sanity evaluation yet, they still make a reasonable effort to preserve any evidence um, that, uh, that would be uh, helpful and necessary for the sanity evaluation if that ever uh, needs to be done in the future. Eric? Nice. Yes. Um, oh, go ahead, Alice. I'm just wondering, can you review just briefly what the, how that, 
piece works right now or something relatively similar to this? What happens presently in terms of the psychiatrist and the psychologist, or don't we ever have the psychologist in there? No, I think it, I think it does happen presently. The statute requires that uh, a psychologist <clears throat> be involved if it's a developmental disability situation. So they could both be involved. Um, I think presently, I think the, the uh, some of the witnesses you have today certainly could correct me on this or, or have more experience with it, but I think presently the court orders the evaluation to take place when sanity or competency is raised, a psychiatrist um, uh, is chosen by the department, I believe, and conducts the evaluation. And um, I think the, as far as whether the, the, uh, <clears throat> the timing of it currently, in other words, um, because of the way the statute is worded currently, it seems to require that both evaluation and competency, uh, I'm sorry, that sanity and competency are always evaluated. I don't know if in practice that happens. I don't know if, if as in reality, they only evaluate competency, if competency is the only issue that's raised. Um, I'm not sure. That might be a good question for a witness. Okay. Okay, thanks. Oh. Okay, and Eric, I have a, a question that maybe jumps off of that. So we were talking about um, conservation of resources, and that was part of the impetus to separate out the two examinations and only to perform the second if necessary. But in this new language, they have to make a reasonable effort to collect and preserve any evidence. So my, my question is, do they do that now? And if they don't do that now, um, to what extent does that involve the resources that we're trying to save if, if it's not necessary? Does, does that make yeah, sense? It does make sense, but I, I don't have any answers to those okay, questions, so sorry. Um, another one for be, the witness. Right, right. Oh, okay, um, all right. Well, let's, uh, unless there's more questions, let's move on okay just pausing for a moment in case anybody wants to jump in that's all right we'll, we can uh we can ask alice's and my question of them when we shift over to witnesses <clears throat> oh, okay sounds good uh so uh moving on to the next section then this has to do with the hearing regarding commitment so um we just were talking about the evaluation that has to take place when sanity or competency is raised. Uh, this is, uh, if you think of it sort of further down the, the timeline uh, of the process, um, the, the uh, court has to, if you uh, presume that, that a person, there has been a finding that the person is either, was either insane at the time of the offense or uh, incompetent, um, to stand trial, then the court, the next thing that has to happen is the court has to hold a hearing to determine whether or not the person is a danger to themselves or others. And if the person is a, uh, is found to be a danger to themselves or others, then they have to be committed either to the Department of Mental Health or, and as you see here, line three and four, page four, uh, if applicable, uh, the, uh, remember I mentioned this earlier, they would be committed to the Department of Aging, uh, Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living if it's uh, a developmental disability situation. So what you had done here was that uh, when it um, passed the Senate, you provided that the member, I'm on lines one and two now, top of page four, that the person is entitled to have counsel appointed by Vermont Legal Aid. So they're gonna be represented by legal aid if they choose, they could also choose to retain their own private attorney if they wanted. And then you also provided in the second sentence that DMH would also be entitled to appear and call witnesses. So consistent with what I mentioned earlier, which is that it's potential, potentially the case that Dale would be involved here rather than DMH. <clears throat> if it's a developmental disability case, this provides that DMH and if applicable, Dale will be entitled to appear and call witnesses. Am I remembering right, Eric, that we got rid of, wasn't there originally a provision that said the AG's office represented DMH? 
Was yes, I think I think there was originally. Yeah, and we we took that out on purpose. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So that's just um, truing that up with the other place where we added Dale. Can I exactly, exactly. Can I just ask another question? Yeah, Which, go ahead. I realize this is not changing, but does Verm uh, and I don't know this about Vermont Legal Aid, but are they? Um, I realize we want them to be involved. That's great, but I'm wondering, under Vermont Legal Aid's own provisions, can they represent very wealthy people who have? The ability to represent themselves is that an issue for them i'm sure or you know well when we get to them i guess we could ask <clears throat> yes i think i think uh the witness will be better better able to answer that question exactly okay. yeah and i think i think we also added money to vermont legal aid in the in either budget adjustment or this budget to no, cover. actually we took the money out and because of the status of the bill we didn't put it in i don't believe i checked with um stephanie and jane and i don't believe we put it back in because we weren't sure of the status of the bill and i know that the bill will assuming it passes out of house uh, judiciary that's going to head to appropriations okay and we can take care of it there. Yeah, they would have to. Um, but um, I think we might have added something to uh, Vermont Legal Aid for this in other areas, but I'm not sure about that. I know we didn't add anything to DMH. OK. OK. Um, is there more, Eric? Uh -huh. Not in that section, but there's more going forward. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so uh, we're now moving into the section had to do that has to do with uh, victim notification. Remember that was also a big issue in this bill. Uh, was and you'll see the provisions that I'm first mentioning here weren't really changed. And this was the idea that um, that when a after uh, the defendant has been committed to either to the Department of Mental Health, the uh, sometimes the status of the defendant will change, right? For example, the defendant could be uh, released after treatment has been uh, completed. Could be that the defendant would be stepped down in treatment level from inpatient hospital treatment to, to uh, uh, non-hospitalization treatment, which would occur in the community. It could be that the, that the department would um, just not, not renew, not opt to renew the commitment order, in which case the person would be released to the community. So in all those situations, uh, <laughs> what, the, what had passed out of this committee and, and the House Judiciary Committee did not change this was that um, notice would have to be provided when the defendant, um, I'm just moving right to the language right there, uh, when the defendant's status changes in that way. You see, for example, lines, uh, um, eight through 17 or so, that's, that's the situations when notice has to be provided by the department to the state's attorney or the attorney general, and then, and then the SA or the AG has to in turn provide notice to the crime victim that this uh, change in status of the defendant is happening so that they'll know when the person um, uh, is released into the community uh, by any one of these methods that are identified here. So, so the changes here are really, the first two anyway, are, are really technical. You see number 10 is just a language change because that's the way the, uh, the mental health statutes say it. They're discharged from the hospital, not discharged from commitment in a hospital. Um, second one is line 16. You'll say also, that's also uh, just a terminology change. It's the same same concept, but I guess the mental health statute statutes use the word elopes. They don't use the word absconds. So that we're just chewing that up with uh, uh, the language that's used in that area of the law. Uh, the last one here, you'll see, this is uh, about, no, uh, again, the notice to the victim <clears throat> and the way the change is the words that have been added on line 20. Uh, this is one of those situations where, uh, and I 
testified to the House Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee on this point that, and this sometimes happens in the legislative process. I, I didn't see any legal need for this language to clarify that, that the victim of the offense, it's the offense for which the person has been charged. But on the other hand, it doesn't hurt anything either. So uh, I think for, for clarity, uh, the House added the language um, as well as, uh, um, you know, just making clear that, uh, that it was the victim of this particular offense that's the person who's getting the notice. Okay. okay. Dick, you're muted. I know. It's, I said in appropriations, that'll be on my tombstone. Dick, you're muted. Um, <clears throat> would that confuse things if there were multiple victims? Oh. Of different crimes? I don't think so because it's the uh, it's the crime. It's the the highlighted language is talking about the defendant, not the victim. That's the, not, the you know frequently states attorneys will you know lower the crime or drop one offense and because they can get a deal on another offense and blah blah blah. I don't know if this happens here. I, if you don't think it's any, if it's if you don't think it's harmful, I guess I'm okay with it. It just is a little bit of a weird thing. Um, kind of just keep that in the back of the mind and as something that if we were to concur with further proposal amendment, that's one place where I would say we we probably want to remove that language. Sounds good. I'll I'll note it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, sure. I'm just just jotting it down here. Um, all right. So we entered the elopes. We did, and we did that piece, which we're noting for possible removal. Uh, the okay. So now you're coming to uh, this is a section that was removed in the house, and it's it is also related to the victim notice. But remember, this is a separate notice. And it's not the one that we were just talking about where. Uh, the defendant's status changes, uh, uh, their treatment status changes or, or treatment is completed one, and, and then notice is provided. This has to do with a separate situation when uh, the defendant is in the community already on an, on an ONH, an order of non-hospitalization. So the defendant is being treated in the community and then uh, it uh, becomes clear, you see lines nine through 11 that uh, the defendants in the community, but they're not com either not complying with that order of non-hospitalization or uh, this alternative treatment, whatever they're getting in the community is not adequate to meet the person's treatment needs. Now, if either one of those things happen, um, then this language requires uh, notice again. So notice is provided to the state's attorney and attorney general. It doesn't require victim notice after that, but uh, it does require notice to the state's attorney and the attorney general. You remember this this particular piece had been discussed quite a bit in in this committee, and because uh, there was some debate back and forth about well, what circumstances? What does line nine really mean? What does line ten through eleven really mean? Um, so, you know, there was discussion about what what circumstances really would trigger the requirement that that the department provide this notice, and uh, second secondly what would the state's attorney or AG do with the notice once they got it? What's the appropriate thing? So um, you may recall that in addition to putting this language here, you also included uh, language that would study those two issues in the forensic work group. So you put it in both places. You put it here, the requirement that, that the notice be given, and but recognizing that there was still some issues that had to be fleshed out, you also asked, uh, the forensic work group that's established later on to uh, look at those issues as well. So what happened in the House was it kept the, the provision that the department look at the issue, but got rid of it in the statutory requirement that you're looking at right here. So this piece of notice was removed. 
<clears throat> and they kept it in the essentially in the study concept that they would look there, at that. Yeah. yeah. I understand what they did, um, but this is at the heart of the case, a case like Pronto, the one who's accused of murdering the girl on Martin Luther King Day, slashing her neck and killing her in downtown Bennington. Um, and, and this, he was frequently under DMH, um, under the local mental health center. Um, and one of the things that Erica Mastic, I think, spoke about in her testimony repeatedly was that she had no idea that he was failing. If, if this was a um, person on probation or a person on conditions of release, the courts or the police would notify the state's attorney immediately. This guy was on video saying, I'm getting away with anything. I can do murder if I want. And, you know, he was terrorizing a neighborhood and they didn't do anything. There was nothing done because, you know, he was on non-hospitalization. I think if you go back and think about the testimony that we heard from both Erica Mathage and um, the mother of Emily, it was compelling that this, whether you know what to do with it or not is a good question, but at least you're aware that this guy is not, you know, participating in any form of treatment. And I, so I'm disappointed that the house took this out because I, this is a key area of, notice at least the state's attorney's aware um so anyway for me may, this is a key area may i comment on that sure i actually um agree with this change and the reason is because i i have always thought that this was way 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 too subjective leaving it up to the um the therapist or the caseworker or whoever is working with the person if they don't show up for one one meeting and the therapist just doesn't like them, they will would could report it. I, I think studying it is a really good idea, but I've always felt that this is too subjective and open. Just my feeling. Okay. And I know it's a it was a real issue in that case. And I don't know how we do that, but I always I I hate to um do any kind of legislation or changes based on based on um, <clears throat> an incident or an event. So I've lost a lot of faith in the system, quite frankly, over this. And what I've learned, we we bring it up tomorrow on 225, the Butte bill. But what I've heard from people in emails and um, people that I know have who sent me emails. I'm losing faith in a system that's really not responding to the problems. We can get into that tomorrow. I, I highlight this as an area, but if the committee wants to continue to study it, um, I, 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 understand, I understand that, you know, I don't know what the state's attorney does with this information or the victim does, at least they're aware. Right. Yeah. And I, I understand your I understand your concerns, Jeanette. I mean, I've had situations like that. If you go back to the guy that wasn't guilty of rape, was in prison because he wouldn't admit he raped the girl. And even though he would have been eligible to be released, I mean, I don't know if you remember that testimony. The yeah. guy from the sergeant in the army who was accused and convicted of raping a girl that he didn't rape, but he never would admit it. So they kept him in there because he was considered non-compliant and they did a, I don't know, a, a mental health order that he wouldn't admit. So, I can't remember well, I may be term. the only one that that um, had concerns about that in the first place. Yeah. I just think it's so subjective. I, the their caseworker right. doesn't like the person, they're screwed. So, oh. so what did they put in to replace this? A study? Nothing. Study. Mm -hmm. We had it in the study already. I, I'd like this section to stay in or something similar. We can come back to this if we do a concur with further proposal amendment, assuming that it ever gets out of house judicial house, if it ever gets out of house appropriations. I don't know what our responsibilities there. 
you know, don't forget we passed this bill a year ago and thousand mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. I mean there are, I don't want to get hung up on this section because there are so many important things in this bill that ought to be dealt with. We have a system in crisis and mm -hmm. instead we worry about others. Okay, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, so, I think that's it other than the studies, which I'll get to next. Section four, there were no changes to this. You remember this is the, yep. the language that uh, um, permits the prosecution to ask the court for a mental examination uh, when the defendant uh, raises competency as an issue, uh, the same way that existing law, which you see in lines one to four, permits the prosecution to ask for that when sanity is an issue. So no changes to that section. Um, so now we're getting into the reports. I don't know, I'm just gonna check since I don't have my screen up. These, these sections were dealt with by the House Health Care Committee um, and Katie worked on these more than I do. So I'm just asking if she's here. I know if she's here, then she could take over, but if not, I can certainly give it well, a shot. Section five looks like it has you know, only extended for the reason we put in November 1st if you, is because the Senate can't introduce legislation after, this, after a certain date in December, and the House can. That, uh, Katie, maybe you want to take over? I'd be happy to. Good morning. Um, that's the only reason. I mean, I, that date doesn't bother me, except that we can't introduce legislation. So Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Counsel, you'll see the version that Eric has, has the changes from the, the House um, highlighted. But just to kind of remind you what this section was about, the version that passed out of the Senate had an assessment of the mental health service, services that were being provided in correctional facilities. Um, in particular, the evaluation was to look at how services in correctional facilities compared to those provided in the community. So you'll note on the first line, there's the date change of when this work is due. But then when we scroll down to subdivision, uh, subsection B, subdivision B1, um, you'll see that um, in subdivision B1, we're retaining that concept of comparing services in correctional settings to those available in um, the community. And then the house added language that recognizes the, the comparison to currently available services um, doesn't establish kind of the best standard of care. Um, so just because it's in the community doesn't mean it's the best standard of care when doing this comparison. So they added that um, kind of acknowledgement. And then um, subdivision two is a new addition to the evaluation that the house added. If you could just scroll down a bit, please. Thank you. So this new addition would be comparing um, the mental health services um, among different Vermont correctional settings, including between and, uh, men's and women's facilities, and also looking at how the services provided in Vermont correctional um, settings compares to um, the services received by those persons who are in the custody of the Department of Corrections who are incarcerated outside of the state. Um, so kind of looking across the board at how um, mental the type of mental health services and how they're delivered and the frequency and timeliness of services. Next in subdivision three, um, the addition of an assessment as to how the use of a for-profit entity um, providing these um, health care services affects the cost and quality of care in correctional settings. As you know, DOC contracts with an, with an entity for health care services. So this is a look at how the, the nature of it being a for-profit entity um, um, impacts the services provided. And then- well, Can I just, DOC uses all kinds of nonprofits too. So I, I don't understand this. This is, um, you know, the people that come in for, um, uh, I believe it's Phoenix House they used to use, I don't know if they still do, but that's a nonprofit that comes into correctional facilities and provides mental health care um, and group counseling. They use um, uh, 
kind of see this as kind of a which healthcare services are they talking about? Mental health or because this this is I believe on the mental health side they use both nonprofits and for profits. Correct. I believe this is referring to the um, entity that um, they contract with that provides the the um, you know the the predominant amount of healthcare services, some of which are mental health services, and the the name of the contractor has slipped my mind. But yeah, um, no, I understand that. I'm just saying that when an assessment, when they use that term. Uh, that troubles me. I'm... Because they, they should be examining all. Right. Um, this is about mental health, not about health care. So they should be examining an assessment of how the use of non-profit and for-profit entities to whom the Department of Corrections contracts affects the cost and quality of care in correctional settings. If they're aiming this at the current one, why don't we just say how the use of the current right. um, entity? Yeah, if that's what they're, they're, I, they're I, I think I would just flag this as something that we would take out if we concur with further proposal. Okay. I don't see what good, I don't see what good, you know. Well, I think that they, I think the thought is that um, the current contractor is, um, is um, the way they operate it doesn't give good services and it costs more than it should. And that's why they want to study it. Yeah, but we, we just got rid of one and got another. That's because we always get for-profit ones. Uh, you're missing my... I don't know. No, I get it. No, just my point is that we, we're getting, we're contracting. The choices are to either contract for services or provide them through state employees. That's the issue. Um, it's also a question of whether or not the facilities being studied are in a state of flux right now. And I, I understand they want a comparison, but that comparison is gonna be a snapshot in time that may not even be relevant by the time we get back in January. Yeah. I, I just, Flag this one, if you would, Katie and Eric. Sure. Yep. The next subdivision that was added um, by the House um, asks for an assessment as to whether DMH should be providing oversight of the mental health services that are provided by the entity that DOC contracts with for health care services. So that's an addition. And then in subdivision five. Uh, I, think, I think you need to entities again we're getting the same argument here okay we'll flag that and then in subdivision five um, the version that the senate sent over asked for information as to how the mou that doc and dmh executed impacts the mental health services provided by the entity that the doc contracts with for um health care services and the house added and whether it is adequately addressing the needs of those with severe illness or in need of inpatient care. Mm -hmm. So those um, are the changes to the kind of the contents of what's coming back in this report. And then a subsection C was added that, um, you know, in, in the course of doing this work, the two departments are to ensure that social and racial equity issues are considered, including issues related to transgender and gender nonconforming persons. Mm. So section six, the forensic care working group, there were substantial changes there and I have a side-by-side -side, um, that might make it easier to kind of look okay. at. So I'm suggesting maybe we skip ahead to section seven and then I'll just switch documents to show you section six. Okay. So if you could scroll down to seven, Eric, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is a new section of the bill that the House sent over. This is an amendment to um, the existing um, creation of the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee. 
This committee currently has 10 members and this proposal would be to add two additional members for a total of 12 members. And that would mean that there'd be an additional, one additional Senator at large for a total of two senators at large. Um, and then the house member would be a house from, um, excuse me, a member from the house uh, committee on healthcare. And you'll see that change uh, at the bottom. So on line four, um, we have um, member appointed at large by the house, two members at large appointed by the Senate. And then at the very bottom of that section, line eight, we have the member from healthcare being added. I, I would oppose so, this. What's your thinking on this, Dick? Well, I, I think, you know, the Justice Oversight Committee um, works pretty well with 10 members. If the House wants to take their one member at large and, and use that for a, um, pick somebody from the health care committee, they can do that. Wait, go back up, Katie, because I want to see the, the top here. Is it six members appointed by the? Yeah, now, right it's, now it's 10 members. And they want six and six and mm -hmm. one member at large. So that's seven. There's one member at large from both chambers. Well, that's right so that's now. There's seven. one at large from both chambers. And so they could choose somebody from the healthcare committee if they want. I think extending this committee to 12 members is, is problematic. I've been on this committee for a long time. And I, May I ask? The, if, yeah, go ahead. What's, what is the difference between having um, members? from the house and an at-large person from the house. I don't get the at-large person. They're at, all at-large, aren't they? No, no, there's some that are specifically from certain committees. You have one from the appropriations, one from health and welfare or house committee yeah. on health care, one from judiciary, one from institutions. Um, and we've always had one at-large, which allows would allow them to um, Someone. So yeah, then, I, okay. I, I agree with you, Dick. I, I think in general, the House prefers larger committees. Yep. Um, and, and maybe that has to do with the fact that they work in large committees um, over there, but right. I don't see why you would think, make this any yeah. bigger. I think it, also, it, gets unwield, it gets unwieldy with the more members you have. And the Senate, we had a member last year who never showed up for a meeting. It was Senator McNeil. Never came to a meeting, One not come to one meeting. So can I just say, add one of the reasons I think they prefer larger committees with more members is because they have 150 and they need to spread the joy around. Understood. <laughs> I don't know if I'd call this one joy. Well, anyway, it... I, I think this is something we, we should reject. Okay. If they want to change their at-large member to a member of the health care committee, they can do that. The speaker has complete charge of that. Okay, let's flag this. Yeah, I've noted that one too. Okay. It, did they say why they wanted it so big or just to get, get the... I, so I'm not always in the room when, it's, when a bill is being discussed. My recollection though is when we look at section six, there is um, a report that's coming to this committee that involves um, a forensic treatment facility. And there was a discussion that there was no designated expertise um, from House Health Care that could weigh in on, on viewing that report. Well, again, I would point out that if the speaker wants to, she can appoint a member from that committee. The fact yeah. that she's failed to do so is not my fault. Oh, and we'll go ahead, Katie. This isn't anything with legislative. Okay. It's not your fault. 
why don't we take down this document and move to section six? Okay. So I think you have to do a stop share, Eric. Oh, I have the same document. Oh, do you, oh, you do? Okay. I think so. Is it? Great. I'll pull it up. You tell, is this the one you're thinking of? That's what oh. I was thinking of. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, um, you, when, when the bill left the Senate, you had created a forensic care working group. There are many elements that are the same and there are many additions. So I've tried to break this one section into different categories to walk mm -hmm. you through what some of the different changes are. So the first category I have um, has to do with the working group membership. Um, and then you'll see um, in the, the column as proposed by the house, the house version adds additional members to this working group, that including a, a representative of Dale, the chief superior judge, a representative appointed by the Vermont Medical Society, a representative, a representative appointed by the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council, three crime victim representatives versus the, the two that were proposed by the Senate, um, three individuals with lived experience of mental illness versus the one that was recommended by the Senate. And then the House language specified that this indi these individuals with lived experience, at least one of whom has lived experience of the criminal justice or civil commitment systems or both appointed by Vermont psychiatric survivors. And then the House version deletes one of the um, members that was proposed by the Senate, and that is a representative from BGS. So no, those are the changes this to is, the members. This is whether you should build a facility, and I don't want a representative from BGS that does the building. It will not fly well with the commissioner of BGS. It doesn't fly well with me. I, I can accept having, you know, the chief superior judge, um, but shouldn't it be his, his or her designee? Um, we don't right. usually tell the judiciary who to appoint to a committee. I don't know if, the, if that's in the language or not, Katie, but. Um, I can't recall yeah, either. My, I, my guess I, is that I don't it's think we tell a superior the, judge. I don't think we tell the judiciary who to appoint to committees. That's really in the purview of the judiciary. So it could be chief that's superior judge or his, his or her des, or designee. It would probably be proper language. It's okay. not in there. Because um, you've that. given everybody else ability to. You know, I don't have a huge problem like with adding to the committee. It's, I think it'll be unwieldy and I don't know they'll get where they need yet, but, okay. um, but I, do, I do think BGS needs to be there to discuss because you're, you're talking about building a mental health facility, but you're not dealing with a problem that's small, but uh, real in Vermont is we do not have a forensic capability. And if we're going to leave it to the Department of Corrections, and they deserve their own facility somewhere um, as a wing to one of their facilities for forensic patients, I, I just think it's missing. And so I think that I agree with Senator Benning that needs to be a member. Um, okay. Um, so let's So the next category um, in this um, chart, but in, in section six, your um, report looked at kind of the overlap in the mental health and criminal justice systems. That's kind of a broad, broad way to describe it. Um, and you had one report coming back November 1st of this year. And so the house restructured um, this reporting requirement. So there will be two preliminary reports. The first preliminary report comes um, February 1st of 2022. And then there's a second preliminary report that we'll look at in the next row um, when we change pages that's specific to the question of whether there should be a forensic treatment facility. And then a final report on both of those issues is due January 1st, 2023. And the idea is that um, the final report is an opportunity to kind of fine tune the recommendations and work that was done in the preliminary report. So in terms yes. of... This is all going to be done by the group up above? Yes. <laughs> and, and you'll see that this group is um, 
they're also um, going to be given in the House version the ability to have national experts weigh in and provide models to this group. So we'll, we'll get to that language. But in terms of exactly what this first preliminary report is looking at, um, a lot of the Senate language was used, but then there were additions and I wanted to show you that. So I've put the House additions in italics so you could see where, where the Senate language was modified or added to. So first, um, the first thing that this report is going to be looking at hasn't changed since it left the Senate. Any gaps in the current mental health and criminal justice system structure. Next is opportunities to improve public safety, address treatment needs of individuals in the criminal justice system. Um, the addition in the House was in consideration of victims' rights in the forensic care process. The Senate um, wanted to look at competency restoration models used in other states. And the House added including models that do not rely on involuntary medication and how cases where competency is not restored are addressed. The Senate um, version looked at models used in other states to assess public safety risks, including guilty but mentally ill verdicts in criminal cases. That was not changed. Um, the House added due process requirements for defendants held without adjudication of a crime. They also added processes regarding other mental conditions affecting competence and sanity, such as intellectual disabilities, TBI, and dementia. The Senate version wanted the report to touch on models for forensic treatment, and the House added including inpatient, community-based, or other treatment models. And the House also left it open for any other recommendations. So again, this is part of the first preliminary report. And then if we scroll down um, to the second page, thank you. You'll see there's another column or another row that has to do with the forensic treatment facility. So this is the, the second preliminary report. And this comes about six months later, uh, July 1st of 2022. So this is the report that comes in to Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee and this committee specifies that based on the recommendations already submitted in the first preliminary report, DMH is to submit this second preliminary report as to whether a forensic facility is needed. So that is, um, and then if the second preliminary report does determine that such a facility is needed, it's in the final report um, that where we're going to have a re recommendation as to the size, scope, and fiscal impacts of the facility. So it um, kind of has a, a tiered decision making. So in the first preliminary report, we're getting information about the overlap of the mental health and criminal justice systems. And the second preliminary report is a recommendation as to whether a forensic treatment facility is necessary. And if it is necessary, the final report is going to kind of fine tune all of the recommendations in the first two reports. And, and if that treatment facility is deemed necessary, provide recommendations as to what that facility should look like. So mm -hmm. by the time you built the facility, if you wait till 23 and you figure it takes five years for the state to build a facility, and in the meantime, we've built a new mental health facility without a forensic capability, um, this is ridiculous. Uh, I, I muted myself so I wouldn't, um, be caught thinking something on that was not good. Again, you're just repeating this, um, but, um, and I realize you wrote it, but you're not, you know, you're the legislative council. I'm not blaming you at all, Katie, but I, 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 I need to know if we're going to, if we're going to take the step that I believe is absolutely necessary, and that's building a forensic facility in Vermont, um, I would like this done sooner rather than later. And to, to think that this is going to be done sometime in 2023, adding five years is 2028. Um, you know, the, the Department of Corrections is being asked to deal with significant mental health issues that they shouldn't have to be dealing with. They're holding people because of a lack, uh, and 
We know on detention, people with significant mental health issues last longer on detention. It increases those number of people in beds and probably it's not appropriate for them to be there. And here we go on with the same old thing. And I feel a sense of urgency here. And I, I just don't think I want to wait until 2023 for a second preliminary report. Um, well, excuse me for the final report. So I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know what to do with this section. I mean, they've got so much stuff in here. Yeah, It could take you to 2025 just to figure out what it is they're looking for. May I ask a question, Senator Sears? Sure, I'm. I'm just. I'm just baffled. When when we are um, talking about building a forensic unit, we're not necessarily talking about it as a standalone unit, right? I mean, it could be part of if, for could example, could be part of a new mental health facility. It could be part or, of a current corrections right. facility. It could be part of, you know, the governor had the campus idea for. Um, different facilities. Yeah, so we, we're right now looking at, um, for example, building a new women's um, prison. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't they even consider, because that's a new building, why wouldn't they even be able to consider whether or not there could be a, a little L off the side of that or something with, I mean, we're, we're doing, yeah. all, we're doing going forward with projects now, and if we're not even going to make a decision until 2023, that seems. I agree with you. For me, there's two problems. One is the victims of the various crimes that are being committed, um, and future victims because we're not dealing with this population appropriately. It is very small. There's a very small population, luckily, but it can do, that population can do a lot of damage. The second problem is we're discussing building various facilities right now, both from a mental health perspective, mm -hmm. as well as in the corrections. I just wanted to find out which department should be in charge of a forensic unit. In Massachusetts, I believe it's the Department of Corrections. It's the correctional facility in Bridgewater that has a wing for forensic cases, I believe. that's It may have changed, but this is years ago. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, you, it, it's that's what I was hoping they would look at. I didn't think it was rocket science, right? We lack the capacity ever since Hurricane Irene, both for, um, you know, the vast majority of people with mental illness do not commit crimes. They're actually more likely to have crimes committed against them. I understand all that. So I wanna make clear um, to all those folks, but I am concerned about waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, you know, uh, Sarah Squirrel, who's since resigned, was going to, I think, was tearing down Woodside to build a new facility, you know, mental health facility at that location. So, you know, that was the plan. And if they do that, then it, it would be more appropriate to have a forensic unit there than at the women's new women's prison if they do that. You know, I think you're absolutely right, Senator White. This just doesn't make I can't live with that. this part really bothers me. Yeah, I I just I don't get why it so would take so long and um, well, we already wasted a year. I mean, they didn't take this up last year, um, and so now we've got another year. We're almost at the end of the session. We, if if all goes well, we, we're about eight days from eight business days from adjournment. You know what I'm going to suggest we do with this section? What? That we add the guiding principles, the experts, and um, the draft language section that are not in, oh, that, that is in ours. The guiding yeah. principles and the experts to ours and get rid of all the rest of theirs. Sounds like a plan. 
Would you help Katie with that? Yes, I'd be happy to help. Thank you. Katie, so, can I ask a question? Um, Section seven, that group is also considering all of this? Um, the section, uh, sorry, so the only report that's going to the Joint Legislative um, Justice Oversight is the second preliminary report, which is whether or not there's a need for a forensic treatment facility. The other reports are coming in um, when the General Assembly is in session, so it goes to subject matter committees. Okay, we're we're um, we're not going to have time for S ninety seven this morning, I don't think. Um, so I, I lost track of the time. It's already twenty minutes at ten, and we're on the floor at ten. Oh, um, but this has been helpful. Um, yeah, I apologize to those here on. Um, S97, um, and, and we'll try to get to that um, next week. That's, that's not earth shattering. I just want to understand the proposal from Judge Grierson that's been added to S97 or the House is considering adding. Um, I think it's fine. I understand that Judge Grierson and Marshall Call have been over. Um, but there are people here who want, anybody want to comment on this draft of uh, S3 that's here. Um, thank you so much, Eric and Katie, for the rundown. We really appreciate it. You can take the share down now, I think. Sounds good. Will do. Thank you. Well, an op opportunity. Um, John Campbell and Evan. Is Evan still here? Uh, I believe he is, Senator Sears. Well, I just want to look at him so I know who he is. There. Hi there. <laughs> nice to see you. Welcome to Senate Judiciary. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to see all of you as well. Yeah. Welcome. So, um, Evan, why don't you, if, if we have a second, Senator Sears, I, I would like to comment one thing on S3 because there is that yep. one section that I, I think is important uh, as far as notification of, of the noncompliance. One part, and I think it needs to be worked, and I can understand Senator White's concern, um, but I, I think it has to be noted that there, it really doesn't um, allow us to really do anything. So it's, it's the fact we're getting the notification. And I think that the um, idea was for uh, us to, if we found information that somebody was not compliant and it rose to such a level, then we would be able to try to um, take some preventative uh, measures or to see what we could do to make sure that that the person would become compliant. Um, but uh, you, however you wanna you know, go with that, we're fine. But I think that it's, uh, I think it's necessary for us to, to at least be advised if somebody is not being compliant um, and, and they have serious mental health uh, issues that are uh, put them as a danger to themselves or to the others in the community. So um, just would like to say that and um, also just to introduce Evan. Evan, uh, as you know, uh, Pepper has left uh, to take over the uh, chairmanship of the Cannabis Commission. And uh, we uh, were very fortunate to have uh, Evan have an interest in, in, that, in this role. And I'd like to turn it over to him and he can kind of give you some of his background. Uh, so Evan, go ahead. Sure, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly... Uh... I'll br briefly review where I came from. I, I graduated from Vermont Law School in 2008, and Hamilton College in Central New York before then. Spent two years in private practice at Paul Frank and Collins up in Burlington. And then after that, I did a five-year stint in the criminal division of the Attorney General's office. I then went to the Office of Planning and, uh, and Legal Assistance at the Agency of Natural Resources went back and did another two year stint in the criminal division of the attorney general's office. And I just recently left my position of associate general counsel for the natural resources board after three years there. Um, and uh, very happy to be on board with the department and to be working with uh, your committee to the degree that I can be helpful in answering any questions. Please don't hesitate to reach out at any point in time. Appreciate that. Are there any comments from Either um, anyone who wants to comment on our comments on S3. 
areas is, where yeah. we, yeah. So uh, morning, morning Fox, Fox and then Jack McCullough. And Judge, I think we can get to 97 tomorrow morning. I'll work on a revised agenda. I mean, uh, Senator, um, they're, they're pretty uh, technical. I mean, minor technical changes that I don't think many will have trouble with. I might have one more issue that I'd like to present to you tomorrow and I'll okay. fill you in on that. Um, thank you very morning. much. Commissioner Fox. Uh, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, in regards to the uh, language around orders of non-hospitalization and, and notification, uh, it's been pretty consistent testimony uh, on the House side, uh, including crime victim advocates uh, who had concerns about this language uh, remaining in the bill as such, uh, and that all supported uh, having this as part of the study to take a look at. Uh, part, of, part of the concerns uh, but from the department's end uh, are, are around uh, the, the other notification pieces in this bill uh, really provide minimal information from a, a protected health information type thing, but, but provide enough information to notify uh, the attorneys and, and victims that a person's being released uh, from a secure setting uh, or from custody of the commissioner. Uh, this starts to get into uh, the type of treatment and uh, what, what a person is engaging in uh, which we, that, that's big, that really starts to move us into kind of that realm of, of what's protected health information and what should be provided. Uh, also, some of the testimony that I've heard as well as, as we've put forward is uh, what information does that do? I think, you know, if you bring uh, the folks back in from crime victims advocates, they were concerned that it can create some unnecessary angst or anxiety in victims. Um, that that may not equate to anything if a person misses an appointment or a person misses a single dose of a medication uh, or something of that, that what's done with that information uh, may not be actually very helpful and could actually be uh, uh, potentially uh, re-traumatizing uh, for a victim uh, and such. We do think that well, folks I, are in order I to- I want to say that we never had, it was never my intent to get information about somebody missing an appointment or missing a, a dosage. My intent was somebody who is uh, completely bombed out, not going, not participating anymore, not doing anything, and who is becoming to the attention of, of uh, neighbors like the Pronto case where, you know, bizarre behaviors occurring, but nobody's doing anything. and. And nobody knows until, you know, something serious happened. So it was never, and maybe we didn't make it clear, maybe it needs to be clarified, but it was never my intent to know that somebody missed a dosage or missed an appointment or whatever. Um, that, that certainly had nothing to do with it. So yeah. I, I just want to assure people that was not our intent. Our intent was that the person's no, you know, it's the sort of thing that would result in a revocation of probation or you know, where you'd have a hearing in front of a court because they weren't doing anything. Right. Sim similar or actually to a, in, engaging in um, behavior that was harmful to themselves or others. No, and I, and I appreciate that. And I think it's, it's similar to uh, the process uh, that one should look at when revoking someone's order of non-hospitalization. Right. Uh, that the revocation generally does not go forward because of a single dose, you know, of mismedication or something yeah, like that. If we did, we'd have, all of <laughs> us would be. That, if I can say that was my, my huge concern with this was because if, and I hate to say this, but if you have a, a therapist or a caseworker who really doesn't like the, the person at all, they could, they could harass them and start, um, if they missed an appointment or if they missed a medication or if they um, didn't go to a class, they, that caseworker could um, wreak havoc in that person's life. And, and believe me, I've seen it happen in the probation system where PO doesn't like the person and harasses them. So um, <clears throat> I've seen I, it I, happen as well. I'm not, I'm not discounting that that happened. Right. The question is, at what point does the behavior should be the state's attorney yep. who and, and the victim who believe the person is actively participating in treatment 
and are um, in the community. And at what point should they be aware that this person is no longer participating in treatment and is back to behaviors that mm -hmm. are so that are destructive to the community? And I, I mean, even if it's a, a, there could, you could argue if it's self-destructive, but if, when it's a danger to the community and others, then that really is is where I was looking for. Not mm -hmm. not that they missed a dose or they missed. Right. Even five appointments. Yeah, and I and I think that it's important. I think this piece is very important. I think that's why you know we we appreciate having it in in the study. I think it does need to be looked at. Um, and you know, I, I would even offer to say to look at it. You know, earlier in our process of of the of the reports or or whatnot, yeah. uh, because I think we also need to really be careful about who does that reporting? How does that happen? Uh, the, one of the basic tenets of, of treatment uh, when you're talking about mental health treatment is uh, the engagement of uh, the individual with their, their treatment provider. And the, the basis of that engagement is based on trust. And so- We've got about like, five minutes left of this hearing and I would need to go to Jack, um, if you don't mind, if, if you wanted to, any other concerns, um, if you could uh, let us know. Sure, no, and just to get to uh, Senator Nicka's question around competency and sanity evaluations and preservation of, of, uh, um, of evidence. Competency, sanity evaluations are frequently ordered either competency or sanity or both um, currently. Uh, so that, that process won't change. Uh, as far as evidence go, generally they're, they're collecting information as they go through their evaluation. Uh, and so I think what this really envisions is that they would then in some way, shape or form have to hold on to uh, any of the, that collateral information that they gathered during this time uh, that could be used uh, in the formulation of an opinion around their sanity. Thank you, Commissioner. Jack? You're not, we can't hear you. Still can't hear you. There we go. Nope, still can't hear you. Even though, even though you're unmuted on the screen, we can't hear you. Our computer's wonderful. <laughs> Fortunately, there's email, so. Yeah. Senator, while he's, while he's trying to get on, can I just say that we wouldn't, we would not object in having this all being determined by a study, because I think there are things in right. there that would be better to, uh, to really flesh out. Well, I, yeah, that, that's helpful, uh, John. Um, I think, I, I think for us, it's the dates of when the study would be due is more concerning. I, I understand that. I actually had a long conversation with Pepper before he left about that issue, um, and he expressed to me his concern of what would the state's attorney do with the information, even if they got it. Um, so, you know, that there's some good points there. Um, so I'm I'm okay with 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 leaving that to study. I'm not okay with not finding out about it until 2023. Well, we're there to help push it along as fast as possible. Yeah. Jack, um, we can come back. We'll be back here next week on this bill, I'm sure. Um, and in the meantime, if you can get your, um, if you want to shoot us an email, that'd be fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I guess, um, committee, thank you very much. I just, um, I sent you an email that we're going to meet next Wednesday.